Uh, which is spoilage and breakage that you're just under no control of us, you know, that we would end up paying for, or that we wouldn't get paid for those records, one way or the other. Um, we, we took a crash course in all of that. How to, we, we got tour support. We weren't making enough money to pay for a tour bus. We were borrowing money from our, our, our roadies to eat. Wow. You know, uh, we knew that we, we started, when we started selling records, when sweet, The Sweet Child of Mine, we made the video above a bank downtown uh, LA. It was very cheap. If you see that video, it's just us in a room. It's black and white. There's a couple, you know, the little camera dollies on the floor, and that was about it. There was a dog. One of our dogs was in it. And uh, I think our, our girlfriends were in it. It was super cheap. Um, but that, they, they released that, the single in that video, and that's what really took off. And we, by that point, we were on, a, on, a, on tour with Aerosmith. And that, those seven people that showed up early turned into 30 the next night. And the next night, it was 300. And the next night, it was, it was 800. And by the end of like a couple weeks, all 17,000 people that were there really, before to see Aerosmith were showing up for us. And, and we started selling a lot of records. The, uh, the album started moving up the charts, the single went to number one, then the album went to number one. And uh, things changed there. So what exactly happened on that tour that made Guns N' Roses attract so many fans in addition to the actual album sales? So as Joe Perry later recalled after touring with Guns N' Roses, he said Guns N' Roses were really different. They, had to, they dug down a little deeper into Rock's roots and I heard a lot of Aerosmith in them, which meant I also heard a lot of bands that came before us and I remember being a little bit jealous because they were really hitting the nail on the head and part of the thrill was wondering what Axel was going to do next. Now certainly the supposed ban on the band's bad boy behavior only applied to the actual tour venues and even as Slash told uh, Mick Wall at that time, we still do what we do, we just stick the booze in plastic cups so it could be like water. So what Slash is referring to is, as part of the condition for Guns N' Roses opening for Aerosmith, they weren't allowed to do any drinking or do any kind of drugs anywhere near any of the band members or entourage of Aerosmith since the members of Aerosmith were two years sober at that point in time. And he didn't want his band members being corrupted by the young guys from Guns N' Roses. Now, Slash also went on to say when he came into the dressing room one night after a show and he basically found the singer Steven Tyler examining the near empty bottle of Jack Daniels on the table, he admitted he was so embarrassed. Steven looked at me kind of, you know, and said, did you drink all this before you went on stage? I had to kind of hide the other bottle of Jack I'd taken on stage with me. Now, Doug Goldstein, who was also working with the band at the time, remembers the tour was really no different to any of the others in terms of having to deal with Axel and Slash. He described arriving at one hotel and being told that the band's rooms had, all, had basically all been canceled. I told him, look, no problem, just call Vanessa, the name of the hotel manager, and tell her we're going to be pulling the bus up to her house and that 12 of us are going to be sharing the bed with her. So this old gal goes into the back and this big heavy Italian looking guy with a mustache and a tie comes out and says, which one's Mr. Goldstein? I'm like, wow, we're really going there? So the guy tells Doug Goldstein, Goldstein, look, you're going to get in your room at three o'clock. You got an effing problem with that. So Goldstein snaps. He said he grabbed the guy by the tie and he pulls him halfway over the counter. He tries to reach for my phone. So I tighten up his tie and he's turning purple on me. And I go, you're going to effing die before you get a hold of the cops. I suggest you get your fat Guido ass back there and get me my goddamn keys. So turning to one of the band's security team, Todd, Doug told him, go put Slash's luggage on a trolley and get him up here now. He goes, what? I go, just effing do what I said. So he goes downstairs and he brings Slash, who's obviously passed out. He's literally upside down and his head in his luggage bottom and his legs are dangling over the top, but he still has the bottle of Jack in his hand. So Todd rolls him up next to me to the front desk and there's like 50 people waiting to get to their rooms. The general manager of the hotel comes out and he goes, hey, you guys got to get out of here. So basically at the end of the day, Doug Olsen was able to get the room keys in about two minutes. So he says, I put Slash over my shoulder and we go to the elevator and I'm riding up about eight with eight guys in business suits and Slash starts urinating down my back. 
I was like, mother effer. I drop him on the ground and the guy's laughing at me. I turn around and I go, what? He goes, look, I don't want to get you pissed off at me, but I've been watching you since you walked into the hotel. I don't know what they're paying you, but it can't be remotely enough for what the hell you have to put up with. So the elevator doors open up and I go, yeah, thanks for the observation. I'm literally pulling Slash down the hallway by his hair because I don't want to have to pick him up by his peed pants. Now, Steven Tyler and Joe Perry were aware of a lot of the antics that were going on with Guns N' Roses, but they also knew that Guns N' Roses were helping them sell a lot of tickets, so they were smart enough to let the circus carry on. And one night, Joe came to Slash and told him how awesome his guitar solo in Sweet Child of Mine had been that night, and when the tour was over, Steven gifted Axel a complete set of specially made silver Halliburton travel cases, costing thousands of dollars. Now, months later, Steven would also go out of his way to help the band through their drug problems, though only Izzy is the one who actually took him up on the offer. Now, Aerosmith also displayed their class by not causing a scene when Rolling Stone arrived on tour to cover both bands and ended up choosing Guns N' Roses for their cover. The Geffen promotional staff were thrilled with the outcome, and David Geffen bought Tom Zutat a Range Rover as a reward for both his hard work and his sheer persistence. Meanwhile, at the same time, Appetite for Destruction officially became America's number one album on August 6, 1988, and they got another video, one for Paradise City in the can, again for relatively cheap for about $80,000. So that interview that I talked about where Rolling Stone showed up and put GNR on the front cover is what I want to talk about next. Now what's also funny is Guns N' Roses and Aerosmith's camps had really been circling each other for a couple of years. So there was a really great interview done with Guns N' Roses back just before they released GNR Lies in Rolling Stone. It was titled The Hard Truth About Guns N' Roses and they basically interviewed the band uh, during the time they were opening for Aerosmith. And this is when we started to really see Guns N' Roses break big. If you've seen a lot of the interviews the guys have done over the years, they said that even though they opened for Aerosmith, a lot of the kids were really coming to the shows to see Guns N' Roses who were just about to hit their meteoric rise. Now, Guns N' Roses and Aerosmith have a bit of history before they even began touring together. So Aerosmith's manager, Tim Collins, at one point was offered the job to manage Guns N' Roses, but he basically turned them down. So Tom Zutat, who was working for Geffen at the time and was the guy who discovered Guns N' Roses, invited Tim Collins, who was Aerosmith's manager, to see the Gunners play in LA. So when the band members came back to his hotel room, Collins checked himself into the second room, into a second room to get some rest. In the morning, he learned that the band had ordered $450 worth of drinks and food on his bill, and it was after that event that he decided not to manage the band. Now, that wasn't the only connection that the guys from Aerosmith had with Guns N' Roses. As Slash put it, the guys had met years before. Slash said our guys were selling drugs to their guys. So the Aerosmith Guns N' Roses bill was a great success, drawing at least two generations of rock fans, and the tour concentrated mostly on outdoor sheds, mini stadiums that seated about 15,000 people, and it's here that Gunners found their audience. So according to the article, the sheds are set out in the suburbs where the kids can't damage too much property, and for a couple of hours, the only supervision is the security guards who have nice haircuts and thick arms, you can get a big, warm, flatliner Miller Lite for $3.75 if you have proof that you're over 21 or if one of basically if one of your feet touches the ground. Now, the guys in the audience wear black t-shirts depicting the last band to play at the venue, and their dates were basically Kmart knockoffs of the clothing that LA models wear in music videos. Now, although Aerosmith was the headliner on the tour and was applauded enthusiastically, the kids seemed to regard the band as history, a band that they knew from the radio like The Doors or The Trogs, and their response to Guns N' Roses was much more powerful and demonstrated an unusual emotional connection both with their songs and their attitude. So Slash said the sincerity of the band shows. That's why the crowds are so violent. Not to say that I don't condone violence or riots, but it's part of the energy that we put out. At times, like in Philly, I thought I could have easily started a riot, said Axel. It's great watching them go crazy and beating one another up, but I don't want to see people get hurt. I hate to even mention anything like that, but I guess we're playing with fire, says Duff. I would seriously hate for anything to happen, but we're not the kind of guys to really change our ways. It seems that a violent incident is inevitable, the same way the Stones were destined to have an incident like Ultimat. I've watched the movie Gimme Shelter probably a hundred times, says Axel. Now in a separate interview that Tim Collins gave, he said he wasn't really even into the idea of Guns N' Roses and he didn't really want to do it even before he met the band. And just like the Toxic Twins, Steven Tyler and Joe Perry, Collins had recently gotten clean. And after one look at Guns N' Roses backstage, 
surrounded by basically dubious characters and barely dressed young girls. He said, I immediately felt the narcotic vibe of the band and knew that I was at a serious risk of relapse if I wasn't careful. Now Collins did say that he was really impressed by Axel, but when he finally got into the bathroom after numerous visits paid by Izzy and Slash, he also found blood on the ceiling and realized that at least one of the band was mainlining heroin. He said, frankly, I was scared of them, Collins told the American writer Stephen Davis. Soon afterwards, Tom Zutaw would end up finding another person to try to manage Guns N' Roses, and the next person after Tim Collins was, strangely enough, Iron Maiden's manager, which was another band that Guns N' Roses went on tour with in 1988. Now, their paths would cross not too long after that, Aerosmith was about to be touring Europe, and Tom Zuta told Guns N' Roses then-manager Alan Niven to keep the band out on the road, keep them working, and so when they had a chance to jump on the next Aerosmith tour, go to Europe. And it seemed like the perfect marriage of bands, and really a chance to repeat the trick of building buzz overseas that could use that could basically use when Guns return home. The only problem was Aerosmith would end up canceling their tour of Europe at the last minute, and according to their co-manager Tim Collins, the last straw was when Joe Perry told him he'd once bought heroin from his Stradlin. So with Aerosmith's newly found sobriety only ever one drink away from cracking and the band finally achieving all the commercial success that their habits had denied them for a decade, he wasn't taking any chances. And meanwhile, the band's new album Permanent Vacation had come out at the end of August and looked to be their first major hit since the 70s. And the European dates were scrapped in favor of a gargantuan American tour now slated to begin in New York on October 16th. So that does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe, and let me know if you guys went to any of those Aerosmith Guns N' Roses shows back in 1988. Thanks for watching, guys, and have a good one. Dizzy Reed from Guns N' Roses, and you're watching GNR Central. Yeah! <laughs>